For the past 35 years, our nearly 100-year-old Kiwanis Club has bestowed this annual accolade upon an individual who has gone beyond the expected scope of their abilities for the betterment and benefit of the Nashville community. As I have told others, this award going to Dr. Ming Wang is long overdue. This is the first time for an immigrant who has become a citizen of our United States of America to be selected for this honor. How fitting this is for our city of Nashville in today's world. One of Ming's favorite statements is to paraphrase President Kennedy, where he says he wants to encourage all immigrants to ask not what America can do for us, ask what we together can do for America. As an immigrant himself, Dr. Wang is indebted to America for the wonderful opportunities with which he realizes he has been blessed, and he wants to do what he can to give back to America. I'm about to tell you how he has done just that. Let me start with some of what you may already know about him. You may already know that Dr. Wang is the director of Wang Vision 3D Cataract and LASIK Center, a world-renowned laser eye surgeon and a philanthropist par none. You also may already know that he, is, he fought as a teenager to escape one of history's darkest eras, China's Cultural Revolution. Through his own tenacity and his parents' tireless efforts to provide a chance of freedom for their son, Ming eventually made his way to America with $50 in his pocket and an American dream in his heart. Against all odds, he earned a PhD in laser physics and graduated magna cum laude with the highest honors from Harvard Medical School and MIT. He embraced the Christian faith and tackled one of the most important questions of our time, our faith and science, friends or foes. This led to his invention of a breakthrough biotechnology to restore sight. To date, Dr. Wang has performed over 55,000 eye procedures and has treated patients from nearly every state in the United States and from over 55 countries worldwide. He is considered the doctor's doctor as he has operated on over 4,000 different physicians. Dr. Wang has published eight textbooks, holds several U.S. patents, and he performed the world's first laser artificial cornea implantation. He is the recipient of the Honor Award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Chinese Physician Association. Dr. Wang is also an active contributor to our Nashville community. He's the founding president of the Tennessee Chinese Chamber of Commerce and an honorary president of the Tennessee American Chinese Chamber of Commerce. The mission of these two chambers is to help educate Tennessee businesses about China, thus helping Tennessee to increase its export to China. I was fortunate to attend a recent presentation by Dr. Wang at one of these meetings just a week ago. And he informed us in his presentation that Tennessee sells $2 billion worth of products to China each year, which sounds like a lot until you realize that we purchase 10 times as much, $20 billion from China. The way to change that statistic is to learn about China and the opportunities Nashville and Tennessee have to sell what we have to offer to China. How? By providing to China that which they need. That is our unique value proposition. See, I was listening. <laughs> what is his unique value proposition? What did he do? Brace yourself. Dr. Wang is the international president of Shanghai Eye Hospital, the largest private eye hospital group in China today, holding 10% of China's entire eye care market. Seriously? <laughs> Dr. Wang's unique value proposition was enabling the Nashville healthcare industry to export its products to China. This is what many of you may know about Dr. Wang. I know him as an incredibly talented and humble human being. I also know him as an exceptional ping pong player and one heck of a ballroom dancer. I am also honored to know him as a friend. 
And like most friends, those who know him best learn things that everyone else just doesn't realize, or maybe they just assume. His amount of effort into philanthropic endeavors is the work of any three people. And all of this is done as he runs a practice full-time with patients in line waiting to have the doctor's doctor take care of their own eye problems. I asked him once how he has this much energy, and he replied, it is a lot of work, but I love it. But I love it. Those four words tell where his heart lies and where his head follows, helping others. Let me point out some of those things that were accomplished just in 2015 for which he is receiving this award. He launched the Wang Foundation for Sight Restoration and a host a host family program for blind orphan children. Learning from the successes of helping Maria, who many of you may have seen in Dr. Wang's video. Uh, she was the blind orphan on the brink of human trafficking and prostitution whose sight was restored by Dr. Wang. She is now a happy teenager who can see, is loved, gets straight A's in school, and lives just south of us in Franklin, Tennessee. Maria's host family, Stephen Lynch Hendrick, were the key reason for the success with Maria and the catalyst that spurred the Wang Foundation to launch this host family program in 2015. This program focuses on collecting data from families who are interested in being host families and matches them with the blind orphans that his foundation identifies throughout the world. How? They do this by working with traveling missionaries who find these children in remote areas of the world, areas where those children would never dream of having a life different than what they have. Another Ming Wang Foundation invention, the amniotic membrane contact lens. It reached a worldwide scale of application in 2015. Thousands of eye surgeons have used it. And an exponentially countless number of patients have had their sight changed through the work of many, but because of just one man. The Wang Foundation also launched a placenta donation program in 2015 to more systematically and efficiently collect the placenta, which is donated by the mothers after giving birth to a child. This is where science meets faith and a miracle occurs. Also in 2015, Dr. Wang wrote an autobiography from, from darkness to sight. Didn't know you would have that there. Many of you have read it. When you bought it, did you realize that all of the proceeds went to the foundation? An active book tour was started in 2015 also, where Dr. Wang spoke to over 100 groups and organizations about these two programs I just outlined, and to raise public awareness and funds to educate and enable as many people as possible to participate in it. If you've ever been to one of these events, it usually is held on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. For you attending, it's a fun day out. It's one afternoon out of many that you spend listening to Dr. Wang speak a little bit about his past, about China, and about the foundation, and then watching a movie on his dime. Cheapest day out you'll ever have, but very meaningful as well. For Dr. Wang, it's almost every Saturday and Sunday he can do it. I go back to my original statement of one man doing, doing the work of three people. How many of us would give up our weekends after an entire week of hard work to provide this kind of payback to the community of Nashville and our country? The answer is few of us. And if we were to answer it perfectly honestly, none of us. These are just a few examples out of many why the Kiwanis Club of Nashville is delighted to honor Dr. Ming Wang as 2015's Outstanding Nashvilleian of the Year. I give you Dr. Ming Wang.
Thank you, Kenny, and thank you, Big George. <laughs> and uh, I, four group of folks I want to express my appreciation to. Number one is to members of the Kiwanis Club, a club that focuses on taking care of children. That's the mission of this club, and all of us have the soft spot, spot in our heart for children. So I'm very appreciative to um, members of Kiwanis Club and also for choosing me for this honor. I'm humbled, honored, and um, we appreciate it. Second uh, group of folks I want to thank is my own parents. As many, um, as many uh, lectures that I've given over the years regarding science and faith, foundation, and um, this I believe this is the first time my dad <laughs> is able to hear this. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jensen Wang, Ms. Alan Shu. Uh, many of you have read part of this book from Darkness to Sight. It talks quite a bit about what my parents have done when I was a kid, escaping communist prosecution, deportation during Cultural Revolution, or Cultural Holocaust. They have done so much, as all of our, your parents have done for you. Now they are getting to the ages my dad has developed advanced Parkinson's. And um, he can only comprehend part of what we are going through today, the significance. And um, my wife, Anna, which is the next person I want to thank to, and thank you, Anna, for all your support and love. <laughs> Anna and I made a big decision to move our parents in with us last year. We know that we're going to experience loss of some freedom and, um, you know, that we have to contend with parents sometimes they have different minds how they want to live when you're in the same house. <laughs> and actually we debated and finally we settled on a plan that we're going to put our parents on the second floor. <laughs> And we built an elevator, because dad couldn't walk on the stairs, so he had to ride the elevator. But, it's a lockable elevator, we have the key. No, just kidding. <laughs> dad, sorry, it's locked. <laughs> no, but, I think all of us, our parents have spent so much time and effort and love to having raised us. It, we could never do more do enough for our own parents. And so that's what and then I decided to do, and they're living with us every day. The third um, group of people I want to thank is the country China, country United States. China, a country that I grew up, has helped me build character, determination, um, as again, as this book talked about in the beginning, I went through a very difficult time during the Cultural Revolution, when at age 14, I was cut off of all education and faced with this devastating fate of deportation and life sentence to the poorest part of the country. And I played music instrument, learned dance, all to avoid the deportation to trying to get into the communist song and dance troupe. You know, it's interesting that these days in America, friends sometimes say, well, it means nice, you have a hobby, you can dance, you can play an instrument. You know what I say? I didn't learn these as hobbies. I learned it to survive. China, a country of 5,000 years, has helped me build the character the resilience, the determination that my parents taught me, there's always hope. 
however difficult the situation is. And it's my hope that the book from Darkness to Sight, the story that grew up in China in difficult times, will encourage more people in America today and in China and worldwide that no matter how difficult your situation is, don't give up hope. America is a country that has given me the opportunity, having given me the Christian faith, made me realize that life is not just about science, it's all about, also about faith. Faith and science can work together, it's one plus one more than two. I learned that at the end of the day, as an immigrant, it's not about how much one can benefit from this great country, what it offers, the security, the education, the opportunity. If anyone doubt that America is a magnet that attracts people and is the greatest country on this planet, all you have to look is the fact that America has an immigration problem but does not have an immigration problem. Everybody wants to live here because it resonates fundamentally with the basic human need for security, love, and safety, and family. So, as an immigrant, as Kenny said, that I, I've been involved in many organizations, Tennessee Immigrant and Minority Business Group, a group that I have funded. The mission of the group is to help Tennessee immigrant and minority businesses to do more for America and the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, I found it, to help Tennessee export back to China what we have to offer. No matter how, who is the president, next president, at the end of the day, as a country, America, if we don't have money, we cannot do what we need to do, which is healthcare, jobs, and education. And the way to do it is to have the money, the fund, the needed. And the fund is created through positive foreign trade, not negative. You got to export more than buying. That's what we're facing as a country. We need to understand other countries. Understand other countries and cultures. No longer just the right thing to do as the world citizen is now the economic necessity for us. And uh, I feel, as Kenny mentioned, I do mention this to immigrants, minority groups all the time, all the meetings. You know the problem that we're facing, the immigrants and the viewpoints are different from folks being here, folks coming, all this negative rhetoric and energy. But I feel we can turn it around to a positive energy by not asking what each other can do for another side, but we, all we, together, can do for America. If immigrants focus on what we can do to this, my adopted country, America, then we turn the energy into positive, and we make this country great and greater. So I feel that I'm so blessed being able to live in this country. And to be honest, as I was preparing to this little talk for Kiwanis Club, I was thinking, you know how much, so much bad things happen in our society. Killing cops, the drugs, the violence, the guns and the people killing each other. I just said that many of these folks, if they just visit so much parts of the world today to see, freedom that we take for granted here in America, still not available in so much part of the world. In comparison, we realize how blessed we are here. We've got it so good in America. Let's don't screw it up. <laughs> and uh, I feel it is my duty and calling as an immigrant to pay back. What drives me to pay back is this sense of appreciation of having experience or once having not. 
Now I have something I feel I want to give back. And uh, the last group of folks I want to thank, one person I want to thank, is God. In America, I found God. Found that life has a larger purpose than what we do daily. That I always say science and faith can work together. Science and faith are the two different sides of the same coin. Coin being the life itself. Science, we study cells, genetics, genes. Science is about what things are, and the faith is about why things are. By combining science and faith together, we can be better human beings. We can make our society better. So I feel it's my duty, also being a scientist and a Christian, to combine them. To encourage the dialogue between these two camps, and uh, you know, often I got a question asked to me that mean why you work so hard to uh, involve in medical charity. You know, I have to admit it's not a, some glorious goal or something that I do it because whatever, but I do it because. You know who appreciates sight the most? Those who are blind. Who appreciate freedom the most? Those who used to not have freedom. So what's facing America today? The challenge we're facing, while we still have freedom, is no less than: Can we truly appreciate freedom and protect it? Don't let it get eroded away. Can we rise above, become? People, first time perhaps in human history, they appreciate something as precious as freedom, without having to lose it. So in my case, I appreciate the opportunity when I see patients suffering, being blind. The main reason that I want to work hard to help them in suffering is because I have suffered myself as well. I feel emotionally I can connect to them. When I see Maria, Kajal, Francisco, many other blind orphan children we helped, it's because I was in their shoes one time. I can go beyond the normal duty as a physician to truly care for that person emotionally. So having suffered, give me the strongest impetus. Of helping someone who is suffering, and I want to close by just tell you the story of one such blind orphan. This was several years ago. I got an email from a student who was doing volunteer work in India. She found that there was this child. Who was left on in a train station to die? The child was four and a half years old, and they found that the child's name is Kajal. She was left in the train to train station to die near Calcutta, India, because her own stepmother poured acid into her eyes one night when Kajal was sleeping, in an attempt to change Kajal into a blind child singer. Who will get more、uh, money from tourists? Kajal was intentionally blinded, but then was、uh, abandoned. Why? Because they found Kajal had no talent in singing; she couldn't sing. So they abandoned this four and a half child, blinded, starved to death in the train station. That's where this volunteer student identified Kajal. Sent me an email. From there, we started what we call the Kajal Project, and I think it's very fitting to tell the story of Kajal because that's what Kiwanis Club is about. It's about children, men and women together in the get this together in this club to devote our resources and heart for children. So we got hundreds of Nigerians involved in getting Kajal to America. And the night when I Kajal was arriving, 
We have one foundation member, 94-year-old Wallace. He was bedridden, paralyzed, and he wheeled his wheelchair to the clinic. Say, me, I want to give you this. You give to Kajal. She's arriving tonight. And I saw it was a music box, and Wallace paralyzed, very sick on oxygen. He got himself out of the bed and made this box for Kajal. It was a music box. I said, why is the music box? Because Wallace said, put this on Kajal's cheek, wind it up when she arrived. So I appreciated it, I took the box. I approached Nashville Airport Authority. I said, could I go into the airport to greet Kajal? She's about to arrive. And they gave me special permission. So I was waiting in the terminal as Kajal and her caretaker, Grace, came off the plane. And Kajal was hanging the apron of Grace very, you know, can you imagine a four and a half years old? Couldn't see, couldn't really hear because she did not speak English. So she was very afraid. Then I welcomed her and I did what Wallace asked me to do. I wandered in the music box and put on Kajal's cheek and the music started singing and she broke into a big smile. Then we took Kajal in and because we need the whole family. Kenneth mentioned about our program started in last year for host families because without host families, we cannot help blind, orphan children. Our foundation's focus is blind, orphan children. It's hard to imagine more deserving human beings than blind, orphan children. Foundation doctors donate our services, but the kid has to stay with someone, not just medical, but also living or other issues. So we found three host families for Kajal. And they took great care of Kajal. They actually fought against each other. They want to have Kajal. So we end up keep them peaceful so they ro rotate. <laughs> they, all have, they all get to have Kajal and to take care of her. And we pray about Kajal surgery because I knew that Kajal was intentionally blinded. So the chance of side restoration is very limited. So we prayed and uh, I was praying in earnest. Looking at Kajal remind me of my own suffering at a young age. And I wanted to do everything possible that I could to help her. So on the day of surgery, I opened Kajal's, the scar cornea, and I found something unexpected. The entire eyeball, the content was destroyed. I have helped many chemical injury patients, but most are adults, because and when you get injury, you know, alcohol or alkaline spreads towards you, you will squeeze your eye run away. So the injury is more limited superficially. But in Kajal's case, she was held down on the bed by the stepmother with eyes pried open with acid pulling, with an intention to destroy the whole eyeball. Let the acid sits all through the entire structure. So I've never seen so damaged eyes. I closed the eye and I was sweating all over. I was afraid of facing the three host families and the caretaker grace because injury is so difficult, so hard, it's impossible to repair. I became angry at my God. I could not understand why God is so loving and benevolent would let the most horrible situation happen to the most helpless human being. Why? Why didn't God just let even one little bit of structure of the eye remain intact so we could have at least a chance? Because one eye is completely destroyed. We only have one eye to work. I was angry at my own God. I came out of the operating room, I related to the three host families and the grace. I said, we did what we can, what we could, but this eyes too damaged. We may not be able to restore any side, maybe just a little bit. They were very upset, everybody. In the in, in ensuing months of healing, I kept on being asked by these families, the host families, oh, what's gonna happen to Kajal? Can she see a little bit today? They are looking for answers. 
from me as the surgeon, but when I look back, there's nobody behind me to answer the question. I, as a doctor, supposed to have the answers, but I don't. I did not have answers. I was very mad at my God. I did not understand why God would allow such atrocity happen to such someone so helpless. For months, I was very depressed. Seeing Kajal gradually recover a little bit her sight, she can see a little bit shadow. Um, but she became a little child that kind of picked up the life in America with three host families. I was happy to see her moving about, you know, happier, but yet I knew we could have done so much more if the injury was not that severe. So for months, I did not have peace with my God. I was angry. Then, eyeball came. The foundation's annual gala eyeball. At the eyeball, we always feature one patient. So Kajal was the feature in that year's patient. This was almost 10 years ago. On stage, it was these three host families. They talk about their experience of taking care of Kajal. Each of them tell what they have done with little Kajal, how they helped her. Their kids are involved in helping Kajal as well. But I was sitting there listening. The three host families' experience of taking care of Kajal, I realized something for the first time. Because these families talk about not just how they help Kajal, but also how Kajal has helped them. They talk about how their own kids in America becomes more appreciative. Their little kid became a little bit less demanding and because they see this little kid blind, suffering, came here in America and happier and make the best out of what she had. They made their own children, the children of these three host families, appreciate what they have in America. Then I realized at the moment, listening to these host families, talking about not just how they help Kajal, but also Kajal has helped them, their own children, being, become more appreciative of what they have in America. I realized, perhaps, God's answer to our prayer sometimes may not be exactly the shape or form we want. Because I was angry at God because I prayed for God, Kajal's eyesight, and it was not granted. But then I saw the impact of Kajal's suffering on so many other people, all these children of those host families. Kajal has made those children more appreciative of what they have in America. Then I realized that perhaps God has answered our prayer in a different way, in a larger context, in a more fundamental way. I look at the little Kajal wearing a little a cute little skirt and still blind, but she's smiling because she is loved. I realize that sometimes as human beings, that even if no light could come from outside, light could emanate from within. To have God in your heart is a light in yourself. We respect what the circumstances and the, that's the goal of this book is to encourage young people in this country to appreciate America and no matter what the circumstance you're in, recognizing it is the light in your own heart with God in your heart it will truly give you that hope. So finally, my anger towards my God began to recede. I realized that maybe God has answered our prayer in different ways. You know how it is in life, sometimes when you pray for something, the challenge is what God did, what, what if God did not grant you what you are praying for? It's easy to keep our faith, believe when things are going well, or God give us what we want, but it is harder when, when we pray for God did not give us. How can we cope with that as a Christian? I realize in this case, Kajal had taught me to learn the larger context of what we pray for. 
that is Kajal's suffering as much as I don't ever want to see that I'm so sympathetic and feel, feel so bad for her that does have some positive effect that is to help so many other children appreciate what they have. So when finally come to Kajal's turn, we give a microphone to Kajal. Kajal say something. The 500 eyeball attendees in downtown Nashville Hilton Hotel say something. Kajal took the microphone. She broke into a big smile. She had a little secret. Kajal, uh, after she came to America, she was almost five. She decided, because in her own little mind, when she was intentionally blind in India, then was abandoned because she found she was found she couldn't sing, so could not become a blind child singer. In her four and a half year old mind, she believed that she was abandoned because she couldn't sing. So all she wants to do is to learn to sing. So after Kajal arrived in this country, she made friends with several children of this whole family. Kajal learned to sing. So at that moment in the apple, I give her the microphone. I said, could you say something? I expect her to say something in English, a language that she picked up a few months prior. And Kajal took the microphone, big, big broken, big smile. Actually, her picture of holding a microphone, big smile, was actually reported by Reuters. The pic, her photo appeared in newspapers in over 70 countries. Thanksgiving 2007. Kajal took the microphone, she broke in a big smile because she had a secret. She could sing now. So at that moment, under the watchful eyes of 500 Ibo attendees, who all, we all love Kajal so much, I was there, finally had a little bit more peace with my God, realizing God has answered my prayer at the end. Kajal took the microphone, she sang a song. It was the same song that Wallace, the 94-year-old board member of the foundation, made into that little mu music box seven months prior when I initially presented Kajal when she arrived. Kajal took this microphone in her cute little skirt. She sang a song. And the name of the song that she sang was the same song that made into that music box that Wallace, the 94-year-old, gave to Kajal several months prior. The name of the song was Jesus Loves Me. Amen. I want to thank everyone for coming today. It is an honor and a humble pleasure and honor to receive this award. But I want to, through Kajal's story, to share with you that when we pray to God, sometimes God does not necessarily answer all the way we want it. At the end, it's not what we want matters, it's what God's will matters. At the end, human life is more valuable than perhaps through our own experience, own suffering. At the end, we want to give back. Thank you.